You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks. This Thinking Brunch session features Renee Hollis, Phila de Bunkle, Sean Holt and Renee in conversation with Emma Espiner. Ah. Wow. <laughs> so that was my first trick. Um, my next <laughs> trick is to, um, yeah, sorry, I was saying I'm delighted to welcome you to this first Thinking Brunch for this year's Puka Puka Talks. And I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Emma Espina in a moment to introduce the panel. But before I do, just a few housekeeping things. Um, please make sure that your phones are on silent or turned off. Um, if you could all check, because every session so far we've had one phone go off, so it'd be lovely if you could check. Um, there will, this session is going to be 90 minutes, so th for the first time this year we've decided to extend the length of the thinking brunches because they're always around topics that um, a lot of people have a lot of questions and are really keen to engage with the panellists. So um, there will be about just over an hour of discussion and then we'll be opening up for questions for about 20 minutes um, in the, in the last half hour of, of today. Um, I want to say a huge thank you and happy National Bookshop Day to Paige and Blackmore, who are our principal sponsors for this event. And OK, there's nothing else to do but to hand over to Emma. Thank you very much, Emma. Please join me in welcoming Emma and the panellists, and she'll introduce them all. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Good everyone, my name's Emma and I'm delighted to be here and to be the chair for this panel today. Um, I'm semi-local, so my mum is from Golden Bay and spent all my childhood holidays there and now my daughter is five and we take her for all her childhood holidays, so it's a very special place for us and our whanau. Um, I'm going to ask our panellists to briefly introduce themselves to you and then we'll crack into business and we're going to be talking about living longer um, and also exploring what it means to live well. So, Renee, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, is it working? Okay, cool. Um, good morning. Um, I have been known as, uh, got a little label as the Grey Whisperer um, that I <laughs> seem to have inherited. Um, I'm from Nelson, and um, in 2017, I worked on a huge project where I interviewed 120 centenarians all around New Zealand, um, aged from 100 to 111 and recorded their stories and um, yeah so I've, I've met lots of and become friends with a lot of uh, centenarians with all different backgrounds and interesting stories to tell so morning all my name is Sean Holt a doctor uh, trained in England arrived here 21 years ago today and uh, <laughs> so you know I'll be sporting tonight the old ones <laughs> and uh, uh, as you can tell from this terrible accent, I was actually born on Coronation Street itself. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'm probably the only doctor in the country who specialises in natural products. And, uh, of course, uh, Nelson is the epicentre of New Zealand for natural products, as we all know. Uh, both from a sceptical point of view, uh, criticising some of the ones I think can be harmful, but also promoting the ones I think we should use more. Kia ora. I'm Philida Bunkle, and I'm a typical boomer. I fit right into the boomer demographic. I've had an enormously varied and hugely privileged life. And I was uh, educated, excessively educated, you might think, through all women's institutions. And uh, then I arrived in Kiwi land as a newly married woman, married to a Kiwi and I'm still dealing with the shock. <laughs> Kia ora, everyone. My name's Rene. Um, I think I'm probably the oldest one in the room. <laughs> Some takers, are there? <laughs> uh, I'm from Wairau. Um Originally, that's where I fuck a puppy to. 
and um, it's very nice to be here. I love Nelson. I live in a place called Ōtaki in uh, North Ireland, and the climate is exactly the same. So when I was flying here yesterday, I just thought this is going. To, I knew that it was going to be a lovely day today because it was so in Ōtaki. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good. Mm, Let's give them all a round. All right, Dr. Sean, why are we living longer? We are living longer. Uh, if I had uh, slides behind me, I'd show you an amazing slide in its life expectancy over the last several thousand years. And until about 1800, it was 25 forever. And then uh, 200 years ago, you see this massive increase. So now I think a, a child born today has got about a 50% chance of living to 100. That's pretty remarkable. You know, the pension age of 65 was set at such because virtually no one got there. Mm. <laughs> they didn't have to pay it. So we definitely are living longer. It's not just longer, though. It's, it's better as well, which is, I think, equally as important. We That's don't, right. We Please don't, want don't to... jump ahead, though. We just kind of deal with of this. Of course. <laughs> oh, do you not want to do the whole 90 minutes no. myself? Oh, okay. Uh, right. Doctors, uh, very hard to control. <laughs> so, yeah, we certainly are. Why? Uh, it, it, basically, it comes down to science and technology, I, I would argue. So better health, better food, better sanitation, better living conditions. Now, it won't go on forever. I think we're getting to the peak. You know, scientists who are, who are experts in this say it's probably not going to continue to 200 or 300. Uh, we're getting to the peak now, which is, but it's you know, a fabulous improvement over the last couple of generations. Not everyone's living longer, though, are Well, they? it depends who we is. Uh, in 2017, when the boomers hit 70, there were 45,300 Māori over the age of 65 and three quarters of a million Pākehā. And the figures have always been like that. 1991, there were 11,200 Māori in the whole country over 65. The state pension has always been a Pākehā benefit. It's political that they don't call us bludgers mm. because actually the people who get a massive income from the state are Pākehā older people. Mm. And I think that figure for the completely different, two completely different populations in this country has been overlooked and we is, needs to be carefully defined. Just to add one thing, we now have three populations in this country. Asian people are nearly uh, the same as Māori, but their population structure is completely different and their capacity to support old people and for old people, and this is the key, to support younger people, to be grandparents. The koro and nanas are just aren't there. Is hugely different for those different communities. So some we's have a lot of catching up to do, and some ways have a lot of responsibility. Because you're a bit of an outlier in that respect, aren't you, as yeah. a Māori woman? Yeah, mm. yeah. And, I mean, <clears throat> in terms of life expectancy, I really didn't expect to live after 42. I thought I would die then. And, um, like, I... And I've just kept on breathing, I suppose. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so here I am. Yes, I don't have... Um, I get very tired of people telling me um, how to live healthier and older and <laughs> everything. Um, I, think, um, I think I've just been lucky. And I, I consider myself very lucky indeed that although my body is disintegrating and my eyesight is... I can still work. My brain still works. And if that's the deal, I'd rather have that deal than the other one. And uh, so I consider myself very lucky. And of course, I'm living in the age of technology, which is an, another great thing for me because I can still work. I can still write. Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> mm. Because there was only one Māori centenarian in your book. Yes. And it sounded, I was, you know, reading between the lines, it sounded like you wanted more and that you were sad that there was just one. I, I did a lot of research and I tried really hard to find some other people of Māori descent, but I could only find this one lady. Yeah. Mm. The only one in my family that was, um, she was, lived till she was 73, 
which is a huge triumph for a Maori woman in the 1930s, and uh, because, like it was thought at that stage, they would all die out anyway, and um, so I don't know. Yeah, it's so 15 percent of the whole of New Zealand. Uh, 15 percent of people are over 65. Less than one percent uh, of Maori are over 65. It's a massive difference. 0.9 percent, actually. Mm. Doesn't seem to affect Winston Peters far, though, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Politics keeps just you young. Keep, just keep going. <laughs> they think. <laughs> There was a really interesting um, interview that Kim Hill did a few weeks ago with Dr. Doug Wilson, and they, they were reviewing two books, one which proposed a kinder um, approach to medicine and, and to the care of, of um, older people, and the other one said that ageing is a disease. Do you think ageing is a disease? Well, I've, uh, I actually have a master's degree in complementary therapy, and for a long time I was a patron of the New Zealand Massage Institute, and I'm qualified in any number of natural things, and like Renee, I don't do any of them, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> they're actually uh, a bit boring. Um, but actually, actually, the reason I don't, and the reason I, I completely given up, I have a qualification in nutrition, don't do it, is because I'm really alarmed at the attitudes of hypercriticism, as if it's all individual. And, and the anxiety that goes into every mouthful and the, and, and the kind of excessive vigilance about uh, things which aren't going to matter a great deal. And I just think actually what's really important about food is actually enjoying it. And <laughs> I was um, a CEO of three different alternative cancer uh, centres in the UK and I saw lots of people die with glowing skin. <laughs> and my ultimate conclusion was that if you're dying of a cancer and you want chocolate, have it, put cream on top, have a cherry, pour on the quiche, enjoy it. <laughs> and I just ended up feeling we need parameters around around these things, and normal things, and we need to build in healthier habits. But this um, watching each other's lunchbox and kind of, um, you know, thinking that celery is really fantastic <laughs> is kind of <laughs> misses the point. No, I, I agree. And uh, in fact, the new health products, I'm, I develop health products, and the new uh, batch I'm developing are based on dark chocolate, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree with sort of both the comments, really. Yeah, uh, some people don't want to have advice thrown at them, so I'm a bit nervous if anyone asks me for advice today. Uh, I think it's a choice, and one choice is that you, you, you just enjoy things. You enjoy your food and your drink. Uh, and um, you can have the most healthy and Spartan lifestyle in the whole world. And some doctors would say you may not live longer, but it'll certainly feel that way. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um. I think I'm very lucky um, that I just kind of eat what I feel like eating. I grow, I have a garden, so I grow greens and stuff like that. But I mean, I've done that forever. Even when I lived in Auckland for those 10 years, I ha always had veggies in the garden. But apart from that, I have to say, um, I don't live a very healthy lifestyle. Um, I don't drink alcohol anymore, which is a medical decision uh, that I made, uh, for health reasons, I mean. But, um, yeah, I don't really think about food. I have to really coax myself a bit to actually eat at all if I'm busy. Um, and yet I'll make up for it, say, you know, a couple of days later. I've got fairly relaxed about... Um, I don't growl at myself anymore if I don't want to eat or whatever, or if I don't want to go for a walk. I mean, I used to go for walks, and there's people on the radio telling me every five minutes that walking is good for me, and I think, yeah, well, okay, mate. Um, <laughs> like, who's getting your meals? Who's doing your washing? <laughs> like, hello. And, um, yeah, so I'm very sort of cynical about at all. I do think, however, that there is uh, a lack of training for doctors 
dealing with old people. I am so sick. I am just so up to here with being told, well, you've you got to expect this, you're 90. I mean, why the hell do I have to expect it? <laughs> and why can't they do something about it? <laughs> you know, um, like if my bones are sore, why can't they make them less sore? I mean, I've had to do it myself, so I won't go into why I, how or what I've done. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I make um, cannabis butter and I make biscuits. Hey, Anzac biscuits. <laughs> can, can I have interview? Can, can I ask, was there a theme in the diets when you did your interviews? Because whenever I read of someone who's the oldest ever in a country, they usually have some crazy diet like just lard sandwiches forever. <laughs> it's not the, the, the healthiest eaters of the whole world, is that right? Uh, there was sort of a range. I, I interviewed a person who was a surgeon and he was very disciplined with his diet. But then other people, their highlight of the week was having fish and chips on a Friday. Yeah, mm. um, fried bread. Mm. Yeah. You know, other people talked about the fact that, you know, they just loved anything fattening or, you know, they loved ice cream. And, and you know, when I was watching them having their lunch, they were laying on, you know, the mm. butter and salt and everything else. Um, I think it came down to sort of attitude and, yeah. yeah. And that one woman that went to McDonald's and had a Happy Meal for, oh, yeah. her, for yeah. her birthday, for the 100th birthday. If that's just what she wanted. <laughs> and, and the idea, that the reason for the salt, well, for people my, of my generation anyway, we were um, urged, once salt was iodised, because everyone got goiters, and so once salt was iodised, we were really told and told and told to use a lot more of it so we wouldn't get goiters too. And now that's all gone, of course, but the habit of throwing a lot of salt on has remained. Yeah. I think we need to get the idea that not everything is determined by individual will because we've bought into competitive individualism. I mean, this is, this is the ethic of, of me against you, of it's all my responsibility. The major determinants of health are collective. The toxins in our environment, the contamination of our food, they all depend actually on policies on collective action and that's really where and you're making the point that's really where the determinants of longevity come from who does benefit from that and who doesn't and uh, what is a basis for appropriate regulation uh, many of the uh, cancer people that i dealt with for example would say why me and i'd say well why not you um, you've probably had an estrogenic environment since the womb. You, you know, this was probably predetermined in early childhood, and you, nothing has changed since in terms of your exposure to dioxins, the most carcinogenic category of chemicals. We have done nothing to change that. Uh, the, the role of bisphenol A in, in breast cancer was discovered in... 1984 at Brandeis University. It's still with us. Nothing has changed. So why wouldn't we, many of us, given that history of exposure? Those things are collective. They are incredibly difficult to avoid individually. And frankly, uh, by the time you get to our age, it's too late. Do you think it's a lightly regulated environment in New Zealand? I'm not a regulator expert, so just <laughs> with uh, Catherine Ryan on the radio the other day, I'm going to dodge a regulatory yeah. question. It's not my field, but... Uh, well, you're doing unusual things, though, and yeah. so that's, that, that depends on a, some knowledge of regulation. Yeah. Are you able to do what you want to do and, and pretty cutting-edge stuff? Yeah, uh, look, I think, I think we're pretty much free thinkers over here and people will do what they want to do mm. to some degree. So, mm. uh, and I think we're more advanced in terms of natural health and therapies. Mm. Uh, certainly, I think we, 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 we don't like the paternalistic approach to medicine compared to some other countries. So I think we're doing pretty well from that point of view, but yeah. I just want to close off this session about the, you know, the kind of sciencey health stuff and, and just talk a little bit about mental health because we've got all these issues with mental health and rising, especially anxiety and depression. And I wonder what it was like when you were a young woman, mental illness and people's understanding of it. Um, the, no, it wasn't understood no. at all. And, like, attitudes were pretty severe on everything. When my father shot himself, for example... Um, the attitudes around that 
continued for years and years and years, and n like they wouldn't want him buried in the <coughs> same graveyard. That kind of thing was very, uh, that um, mindset was very much like that. And yeah, so it's, yeah, I don't know. I suppose the biggest changes I've noticed now that you make me remember them, are probably attitudes from about um, nine, the 90s. Mm. So do you think that there was always as much mental distress, but that wasn't recognised? Yeah, I do. I do. I think my mother, for example, um, she died at 42, so she lived for 15 years after her husband shot himself. And not on one day of that was she not worried about money, about where we would live, because she was Maori and we had three kids, and we were be we shifted from house to house because it was always being sold over. So yeah, so it's um, her state of mind. I'm, I'm, it surprises me even now that she was as fiercely determined as she was that we would stay together, mm. because the advice was to put us in. Thank God she didn't do it mm. in the state home. Um, and the reason she didn't do it was because she knew we would be separated. And um, I think she had the feeling, though, that we should stay, we should stick together. So we did. Mm. Mm. Oh, thank you. Is that why you were worried about 42? About yeah, 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 yeah. I thought that, you know, my mother died at 42. So I, and I was 19, you know, and it just seemed... It didn't seem old or anything, but I just thought, oh, well, that's me done, because um, my, my two grandmothers had lived, um, to th they were 50, 50 and 51. So, like, life expectancy wasn't really high on the list. And, yeah, I was quite prepared, you know, I had a good time. <laughs> 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 Lots of singing at parties, you know, that sort of, that sort of time. Mm. <laughs> and some of your interviewees as well, it gave, I think, gave some real insight into some of the social issues around mental health. They did, yes. Um, I, was, I was really honoured and privileged to spend so much time with these centenarians. And some of them, yeah, they re were really honest about what life was like and <laughs> having a father that came back from World War I with, mm. you know, Drinking issues and you yeah. know, domestic violence, and that was seemed to be quite common. And um, yeah, it's, and then other people just talked about how lonely their lives were. You know that their husband had died, their children children were away, um, and they were just sort of yeah, it was quite sad. Some of them, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. I had a girl at school say to me how lucky I was that my father was dead, and it, her father drank and carried on and yeah so I think that was a problem with people my age well I mean it's still a problem uh, but yeah it's, mm. I didn't really understand what she meant mm. until I was older but this shows some of the advances in medicine and, and mental health as well because you know mm. some yeah. of the things you're describing we now call post-traumatic stress disorder of course yeah. whereas in those days it was shell shock or gone a bit crazy wasn't that's it? right mm. Mm. but why wouldn't we be more anxious we live in a times of corrosive insecurity there's um, an economist who um, standing who says that the world now has only really two classes, you work for the corporation, the elite of the corporation, or you're part of the precariat with insecure employment. And one of the things about that insecure employment is that you have very little control over your time or he includes your identity. So it's absolutely, and you think, you think about it, I think that that precariat, that precarious Intermittent employment has actually gone up the classes and it's mm. begun to be a middle class phenomena. And one of the things I think we're most affected by is it now, uh, it now is pervasive in the marketization of the universities in the intellectual class. And I think it's having a dramatic effect on knowledge making. So all of us are experiencing very serious insecurities. There is a crisis of care from the elderly to the youngest. We are short of care. Who's going to care for all these people? How are they going to care for their families? There's a housing deficit which is enormous. So the very uh, the boomers had 
the necessities of life were more or less taken care of. The luxuries were, um, uh, you know, where you differentiated socially. But health, housing, education was, in fact, taken a bedrock of security, of expectation. There was a fairly clear path to home ownership if you were Pākehā um, and so forth. None of that applies today. And it's creating all kinds of generational tensions. So for many of the uh, boomer generation, the question was, how do I escape from the rigid conformity of my parents' lives? How do I get out of 40 years of nine to five? Now young people have a completely different set of, how do they enter into adult world? How are they gonna fit into employment and so on? And the path seems extremely vague. Mm. You might become a rock star um, if you're at uh, Nelson Boys and you can strum a bit, but you might not. <laughs> and what else might you be? Nothing much, who knows? Mm. So I think that corrosive loss of a pattern and the insecurity is affecting absolutely all of us. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't all feel thoroughly anxious. Mm. Well, that's, yeah, and that's something that we were talking about earlier, is that the mental distress stuff is kind of a reasonable response to some things that is going yes, on it in is. people's lives. Totally. But just to, just to uh, add to your point on job insecurity, when I was, I probably shouldn't mention this, but talking about death certificates, when I was a junior doctor, we used to s s sign a load of these, you know, it's part of the job. Uh, and what you wrote on there is it, the, there was a, a line for occupation. And you put one thing down, because in those days, of mm. course, people just did one job forever. Yeah. Whereas now everyone does something every, different every six months. Mm. Yeah, everyone's got six jobs. Mm. But when you get to 80, they don't even ask you what you do. They just, <laughs> <laughs> they just tick retired. I, I, I have had a stand-up with about three of them because I'm not retired. And, uh, and it's the assumption they make when, when they see someone who's old. Yeah. Mm. I just want to pick up on your point about the generational stuff yeah. because um, when I was researching this panel, I found um, Renee's blog. Can I read that passage? <laughs> <laughs> well done. Please, can I read it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. So it's a, very, it's a great blog. You should, you should look at it. She says, as a representative of a generation which used glass bottles for milk, soft drinks and beer, made our own orange and lemon juice, our own gravy, who washed nappies every damn day for a few years, who grew our own vegetables, and that the only takeaways bought were pies or fish and chips, and they were rare treats, as was an ice cream, I'd like to say I resent being blamed for climate change. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> yeah. I do. Uh, um, I, I don't mind taking the blame for some things, but I do resent that very much because, like, um, I didn't have anything to do with the plastic, with the plastic um, that happened. It just, yeah. And I, can, I, I mean, there'll be people here who know that I'm speaking the truth. Is there anything better than a day like this and you look outside and all the nappies are on the line? And... <laughs> And you go out in the afternoon and bring them in and fold them up and you smell the sun and that, yeah. But of course, um, the younger generations after me, in my family anyway, um, used um, disposable nappies and um, it, I guess that works for them, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Because you keep talking about being a boomer as well and really identifying with that generation. Yes, but I think it's absolutely wrong to set up um, the fundamental tension uh, between younger generations blaming boomers for grabbing all the free goodies and running with them. In fact, we're all experiencing the new inequality. We all experience in generationally specific ways, but we are actually all subjected to it. And I think that it's deeply misleading to set us up in, in, in this dialogue as if the problem is the older generation and the younger people are having it hard. Renee is quite right. It wasn't that we had certain set paths and expectations, but it wasn't so easy. The, you were None of the store-bought things, no store-bought toys, no meals out, none of those sorts of things. I mean, it was quite tough. And I think we need to have a sense of solid... The real issues for all of us is the global dominance of neoliberalism. And I've spent my entire life 
fighting that and the assumptions behind it and the individualistic, competitive, winner-take-all society and the lack of collective responsibility. And the other half of my life I've spent as a carer in every known role, including you know, bedside care. But um, I, I, I think it is absolutely wrong for us to blame each other. We actually have a collective problem and the collective problem is accelerating global inequality, which is concentrating power and wealth in a tiny group of people. I shall simply treasure the words, Rene is right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard those very often. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. <laughs> oh, I love it. Hope I live long enough for somebody to say it to me. <laughs> well, you're reaching across those generations, and you've said that your, your kind of mission in life is to value the words of older people. It is, and um, I was just amazed at how people shared with me. Um, they talked about all sorts of aspects of their lives, and um, I think one, one really special conversation I had was with, with a man who... Um, his wife had died, he didn't have any children, had, and he'd just been put into care for the first time, and he wasn't mobile, and um, he'd been very involved in the engineering industry. And he said, people would just always come and ask me how to do this and how to do that. And he said, um, he said, he said Renee, um, if a man loses his hobby, he'll be dead in six months. And I sort of looked at him and I said, really? And he said, that's what will happen. And, and sadly, he died three months later. So... Um, mm. For me, I kind of thought, wow, that's some, um, mm. yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that, except yeah. I'd change it to work. I, like, yeah. I, yeah, I can't tell you how much it means to me to be able to work mm. still. Um, and I think that's probably, I'm just lucky that I've got this particular job that I can just, you know, get up, get showered, have breakfast, and then sit down at the computer and do the job. And I'm, I'm aware that that's luck, that a lot of other people can't do that. And, and so they have some physical disability, so they can't go out and do the garden like they used to either. But I do think getting some sort of um, interest or job mm. or work or whatever it is is huge, just hugely important. Hmm. for us to feel um, valued and also to feel needed age. as well seems yeah seem I to don't be care thing. about being valued okay. um, <laughs> I mean I, it, I care what I think you know okay. I'm, I'm totally self-centered and um, I and I just care if I'm pleased with myself then I'm okay if I'm not pleased with myself I'm not mm. and um, yeah so but how do we how do we future-proof ourselves, we've got this fantastic privilege There's no way. of leaning to 83. Well, can we, you, you can sort of future-proof your house or whatever, but how do you future-proof yourself against loneliness? How, how do you do that? How do you keep companionship and uh, communication going? I mean, is there a need for other sorts of families? other sorts of households, other sorts of collective. Do we all have to live in little grey and white boxes and um, not speak to anyone? I mean, if loneliness is the key problem and it's human contact which keeps us lively and, and writing or speaking or whatever, so how can we future-proof our communities? My, my partner was chair of a, a trust set up to promote um, uh, communication for old people, um, being able to use free telephones to any number of people. And they had a wonderful, they had wonderful buy-in from all sorts of companies, but could they get one penny of public funding for what was actually identified by older people as the key issue? They don't get to speak to anybody, no. So, you know, we need to think, I think, really begin to free up the way we think about how we're going to retain human connection and relationship. Mm. Some of the um, childcare centres are now co-located or, or have a relationship with, with rest home facilities, which seems like it works really well for both. It's just that integration, isn't it? Well, how about multi-generational households? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I quite like living on my own. 
I, I mean, it's, it, I, I, I know it sounds selfish, and, um, I, but I actually quite li- I li- I like myself. You know, I'm, I, I'm quite mm. happy just getting on with me. And um, I mean, sometimes I'm a bit of a drag, but, it, it, but uh, yeah, and I, but I, I mean, again, I don't know. I don't understand um, the need. <laughs> I just do not understand why people get excited about talking to people or something. Like, I just, I just do not understand it. And um, I've always been, I suppose, self-contained. Um, I guess I learned that when I was a kid. But even so, and it's not that I don't see anyone. I see people all the time. And I've got this little Lilliput library out on my front fence And when I first started it, I used to go out once a week and look at the books and put some more in and that sort of thing. But now, look, for the last six or seven months, I I haven't done a thing. Everyone who borrows the books or takes them, because they don't have to bring them back, they just do it themselves. So there's a little activity going on out there. And while I don't actually speak to them and they don't speak to me, we kind of communicate and and so they you know little cars will pull up jam on the brakes get out with a couple of books stick it in the lilliput thing then and then go off and like no words are said uh, but it it kind of it's kind of a conversation Mm. that we're all having so uh, yeah anyone who wants to start that i recommend it it's just beaut I i went out to a hui a couple of weeks ago and when we'd finished um, the panel that I was on, um, uh, a Maori woman came up to me and gave me a big hug and she said, you brought real love into Otaki when you put up that little library. <laughs> and yeah, so do something like that and that will, you know, um, it was broken once, once, and I would have strangled. If I could have got the person who did it, <laughs> <laughs> they would not have been walking around, I can tell you that. <laughs> Um, but I got a friend and she found some perspex and she um, tidied up the door and rebuilt it and stuck the hinges back on and, um, and so it's, it's, it's safe. But that's the only thing, like that I've never had any bother at all otherwise, just a mass of people. They love books. Mm. I think the common theme is, you know, there's no right or wrong if you want to socialise or not socialise no, yeah. or work or not work. But I think the common theme is actually using your brain and keeping your brain engaged. And it's like a muscle. And, you know, I think doctors are starting to realise this. You can train it and increase it and, and get a reserve capacity. Mm. But I think older people are a great um, resource. Um, we co-parent a four-year-old, now four-year-old, and it brings joy and life and, you know, it's wonderful. Uh, who wouldn't who wouldn't do that? And a fifth of grandparents, roughly, are heavily involved in the care of grandchildren. We seem to have lost sight of intergenerational things. But in Britain, a fifth of grandparents say they don't see as much of grandchildren as they would actually like. But there are other ways of having multi-generational households if that floats your boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't it's imagine anything worse, pain. but never mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My youngest granddaughter, she's 10, she did a, a talk on, her, on me, her grandmother, and uh, her grandfather, who li- who's Chinese, he lives in China. And, um, and she read my, believe it or not, she read my book, the, the, t- These Two Hands. And God knows what she said in class, because um, her father tried to get the talk so I could see, I could sort of vet it, but um, it was no good. So whatever she said to the class is now probably my life. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, yeah. Granny doesn't want to live with us. <laughs> no, and, and she, she, doesn't, she calls me Renee. Oh, she calls yeah. me Renee, mm. yeah, yeah. The reason I called my mother Rose in the book is because I wanted her to be a person. I don't, like, mum is a lovely word, don't misunderstand me. I don't mean not use mum, but when you're thinking about your parents, some of you here today will be thinking about writing your life stories. Think about the mother, think about the woman that she was. Um, I mean, I said to my son when he was 16, uh, you don't ever think of me as Rena. You don't see me as someone with her own ideas and stuff. You see me as mum. 
And he, he admitted that that was right. And, um, I mean, I was handy when he wanted someone to rehearse his speeches and stuff because I'd been in theatre and all that. But he didn't really see me. And from then on, he called me... He still calls me René, and so his daughter calls me René, um, which is quite nice because it means they see me as that, I guess. Mm. Yeah, yeah. One of the um, best pieces of writing um, that I've come across in the last year was, it was something that Philida wrote for Newsroom, which I, which I wrote for as well, and, um, and it was a, um, a comment, really, on your former husband's autobiography. Searing, but, it, but, but I was just thinking about it in relation to what yeah. you were saying, because it's the roles and how you're seen, and you were the yeah. wife, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you were mentioned at all, barely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. yes, I actually... Uh, I, what, what I was considering in various ways was um, there's a lot of discussion of, you know, feminism and so on. And when I think about it, I think, well, we worked really hard. We were really hard at change. We were the open-minded people who, you know, willing to discuss everything. And... and Nothing's really changed. So where did all that effort go? And then um, uh, my contemporaries, male contemporaries, started writing these autobiographies. So I thought, well, let's see what they have to say. And I read uh, a whole range of male boomer autobiographies. And I thought, oh, so that's what happened. <laughs> because... Um, they are ab some of them were actually part of what we believed was a way of changing things and participating in different ways. And I'd read these, and there were people I knew, and I'd think, that's not what I remember, or whatever. And they were really quite stunning. And the sorts of things that the men said about themselves were completely different from things that women would say about themselves of the same generation. Like, there was no emotional development at all. They didn't self-reflect. They didn't ask themselves about their roles. Uh, it was just terrific. It went from triumph to triumph to <laughs> triumph. <laughs> and they're just a stunning generation, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and... In the background, there's these women come and go, <laughs> and their fiancés, wives, of partners. Yes. Um, there's no word. We have wags, but we need a much wider category for these women who... And I looked at five of them, the five I knew the best, and I started to ring their wives. And I said, you know, they say... Uh, 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 and this one of them said, yes, I know. He said, he doesn't even remember which year his son was born. <laughs> And I, so I looked at these five and I thought, wait a minute, somebody is looking after how many children? Well, they had what I call paternal relationships with 25 children. And nowhere is there a discussion about the dramatic change in the families they have created. They all go on and on and on about mum and dad and rigid roles and daddy, daddy, da of their parents and war, and da, ba, ba, and then they float off, and it's all very nice. And when they get to their 70s, suddenly they produce wife number three, five, whatever it is. The, num the maximum was Tom Scott with seven children <laughs> he was responsible for, and couldn't apparently remember the name or year, wife but I mean, two. really yeah. extraordinary. And there is no analysis of how this massive social change has taken place, at whose expense, or who is responsible, or how it's come about. But it's the most salient change in our society. They went from very rigid post-war families to... <laughs> and now they're in their 70s. Uh, half of them are having babies, which seems to... And I think the implication is it, the relationships they had before didn't really fail because of them. It was that they finally found the perfect partner, and now it proves that they're terrific. I mean, it's just the lack of self-awareness or understanding or... A responsibility for where they put their sperm. And there's. <laughs> and I think we were hand wringing about 
reproductive rights and, you know, mothering and getting it right and attachment bonding and all the rest of it. And they're going... <laughs> and it, it's just so... And I think, well, if you want to know what happened to feminism, mm. that's what happened. Mm. Mm. And the best thing is they say it in their own words. <laughs> <laughs> don't have to accuse them of anything, just write down what they say. Because that's been your work really, hasn't it, putting women... Yeah, yeah. That was my idea when I first started writing plays, and it's one I've continued with, put women centre stage. Why should they be there as someone's aunt or mother or sister? Why don't they have a right to be there? And so I did. But you see, um, I was in a very good kind of situation, um, I'd left my husband and I had started and I'd shouted to the world that I was a lesbian feminist. So, I mean, all the hate. <laughs> um, but it, for some reason, it didn't uh, touch me. It didn't make my life bad or anything like that. Um, and I just had found what I wanted to do and what I was going to do and what I've done, and it's totally selfish. Um, I mean, I, I just do what I want to do, and, and that's the way it is. And I think that's what everyone should do. I, I don't mean should you all rush off and be lesbians, I just mean um, <laughs> you should all take a, have a good think about what you really, really want, and, and do it. And, um, I can't tell you what a great feeling, and I guess that's why I'm, um, I've got the attitudes I have now, because I've already faced the dragons. I've, I saw them all in the 80s, and um, yeah, I didn't... Like, when you think about the 70s in New Zealand, and you think about the massive change, mana uh, morhake, you know, the Eva um, at, you know, at Raglan Golf Course, Bastion Point, and then the 1981 thing, you know, and the homosexual law reform, like all those change that I lived through and worked for and and did all that for, they all happened, and um, so there's that. But when I had to go through the work that I've written. Um, when Mary was, we were doing excerpts from Bits and Pieces for These Two Hands, you know, it was a little depressing because a lot of the things, well, all the things I was saying in the 80s are still being said. We haven't solved them. We haven't made the streets safe. Um, my, one of my ideas in the 80s was to work to make streets safe for my granddaughters who were then little. They're, they're grown women, 39 and 38 now, and they've got family, and, and the streets are still not safe. So in a way, I can look at some things and think, yeah, well, I did okay there, and look at the others and think, well, I totally bombed there. Um, and I guess we're all responsible for that, you know, because we all live here. Yeah. Mm. I'm the daughter of a lesbian feminist. Oh, yay, yay, <laughs> so yes. She's up the bed, yeah. and she doesn't want to live with us either. Um, <laughs> 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 maybe maybe there's something in yeah, there but um yeah. Yeah. To that. <laughs> yeah that's for you Colleen <laughs> but we you know she took me to protest marches and things like that when I was yeah. growing up and it was stunning to me to become an adult and yeah. realize you know that it's still going on mm. Mm. it's um it is very um chastening really to think we're going through the same old things um mm. but Hey, I, when I went on the march for, um, like when I first went on the march for the homosexual law reform, it was scary. It was hugely scary. We walked up Queen Street, you know, there was about 60 of us, just a fraction. Everyone on the footpaths hated us. I went with my granddaughter, my grown-up granddaughter on a march um, for um, <clears throat> marriage equality. It was a walk in the park. Mm. Like there were people had, they were pushing kids, they had their dogs, people on the footpaths were smiling. Mm. So like we did win a few things. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. I just want to circle back to the role of work as well. And Sean, I mean, your profession and my soon-to-be profession isn't known for being 
good to the people in it. You know, we've had a number of suicides in my medical school cohort um, in the last five years, and those sorts of things are on the increase, yeah, yeah, with junior doctors. So what is it about medicine as a profession? Yeah, it's a funny one, isn't it? So the reason I'm here is because uh, people don't believe me. Um, mm. But yeah, in my, as a house surgeon in the UK in the NHS, I used to work 100-hour shifts. Not weeks, which is be quite horrendous, mm. shifts. So you're starting from early on a Friday morning to late on a Monday with no break. So even after a morning, by Friday morning, you're exhausted. Yeah. You're making mistakes. Mm. And it's brutal after, after, you know, for me, it was nine years of training. You just hated medicine. You hated patients. And uh, I, I literally, and it, I'm not, it, it's not, it, it's, it's brutal. Mm. Uh, I collapsed on the wards. Mm. I, uh, and that's why I'm here. We, we, we're literally, my wife and I said, uh, after just going to get through this year, because you're not fully qualified till you've done that year. So they have you over a barrel. And uh, uh, we said, where's literally the furthest you can get away from the NHS? And it was mm. here. So that's why we landed here. <laughs> Uh, and, then, and then I looked around and I could see that the researchers were sort of working nine till five and going off to conferences. Otherwise, <laughs> this is the life for me. And, um, uh, and I enjoy the academic side of it. So, yeah, about a third of it, it cost um, in those days £250,000 to train each of us, mm. you know. And then burn you out. And, mm. and, and, and within a couple of years, a third have left and mm. just doing other yeah. things. Mm. Yeah. It, it's, it's better now. I think, uh, I think in New Zealand, is it, is it 60 hours maximum per week? Mm. Yeah, but then you apply for leave and they they don't grant it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, I, I mean, how absolutely insane would you have to be to come up with a system that treats the people who are supposed to be looking after people mm. like that? Mm. Uh, so it's just it's just beyond. So so I, I do my own thing, you know. I, I do research, I write books, I develop medicines. Mm. You can sort of use your doctory skills in other ways, but mm. um, yeah, it makes me ashamed of my profession in some ways because mm. uh, the the senior doctors, it was it was yeah. simply a case of we did it and you're going to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exact, I think that's exactly right from what I've mm. discussed with people, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um. And Phyllida, you've worked in caring roles as well, but you've also worked in politics, which I don't think is great for one's health generally. <laughs> I, I just wanted to make one comment on the suicide rate, because um, I, and that's what I was looking at. Um, it's actually been climbing for men over 70 in this country, which is... Wasn't that always the case, though? Didn't it go, um, say, to from um, 15 to 27 and then jump to the... It the did, but the, in, but the rate of increases oh, I see. is higher um, oh. over in the over-70 males mm. than it was. There's still this huge difference between men and, men and women mm. by age, but it is... We're it, used to the shitty bit. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, mm. don't, don't actually... Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry, bad language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible swearer, sorry. I'm doing very well so far. <laughs> yeah, we're almost an hour in, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Forgotten the question, or is it sorry. one? No, I'm question. interested, I'm, I'm inter Day, I'm interested in politics and whether being oh, right. a politician was good for your health. Um, it's, I, uh, it's a curate's egg. It's very bad for health, very bad indeed, and it's bad for your family health, and it is essentially incompatible with family life. And um, it's absolutely incompatible with any kind of caring role, active caring role. Um, and uh, I loved bits of it. I liked the house. I like the community, I like the education, I like the policy. I absolutely loathed party yeah. environment, which I think was <laughs> horrible beyond belief. And, um, but I found the rigidity of pretending that this was an environment that could incorporate a variety of roles and caring it was, was not my experience. Mm. And in fact, that the denouement of that was that's how I came to lose my job and exit um, was because um, we had a full time uh, a member of the family who needed full time bedside care, and um, that meant us having um, a house, mm. another house to care for them in. Uh, it meant, uh, and the, that was absolutely fine with mm. the administrators of the role who said use this. Uh, regard this as your second home. But the reality was that that gave people who, um, in that highly competitive advantage, something they could 
uh, manipulate and misuse and um, eventually we were accused of having dozens of houses and <coughs> never being on the job. I mean, it was just, eventually I was cleared in a court, but far too late. But when it came to a choice, actually, of being able to fulfil caring family obligations and politics, it was no choice for me. Uh, but that was a sorrow to me because I enjoyed mm, mm. the issues based, the educational based, the policy based very much indeed. But um, uh, you had to be this, you had to be this sort of highly focused narcissist who was willing to put a nice pick through um, the person to your left and the person to your right. And um, that is not compatible with family care or any other kind of care. It's not comparable with being uh, ill, um, anything other than um, uh, highly aggressive, competitive. And, and that, I have to say, was not gendered. I met some female icicles of... Um, uh, I mean, I, w I was no match for any of them. I no. just had mm. no concept, really, of um, that way of being. Mm. Well, our Prime Minister, you know, she's pushing this sort of kindness um, rhetoric, but she, when she, you know, first got the leadership, she hung Matilda two day out to dry, you know, so those are the political choices that you make because, you know, yes. regardless of those things, you are still a politician. Well, I think she's been extraordinarily upfront. She's recognised her own privilege. She's explained that it really depended on, on, on her partner willingly choosing other roles and so forth. But um, it's, it, it's an example of how things could be, um, but that in my experience, they are, they are not. And um, I think it would be fair to say that if I hadn't had a, a very good... Uh, uh, my partner at the back there uh, who acted as a political wife and I took over a huge amount of the caring role and travelled back and forwards and I mean we had to provide 24-hour uh, mm. bedside care and there was no way that that was possible. No, no. Um, and, but w what I suppose was shocking about it was that although, as I say, the administration were willing to take that on board, um, that all, all that appeared to uh, other politicians was an opportunity mm. to get us, mm. <laughs> nail her, you know, ah, God, God. Well, and the media gleefully you know. engaged uh, yeah, in yeah. that and also. And they yeah. loved mm. it, you know, mm. it was great. That could be represented in mm. um, all, all sorts of crooked ways, you know, mm. taking... Hmm. And the, but the difficult thing in public life about that is that... Um, if you're in a caring role, you also have, and I'm sure this is true of, of, of you in doctoring roles, um, it's very difficult to talk about the needs of the person you're caring for without invading their autonomy and their privacy. So I can remember saying, um, well, one of our children had particular needs. And... Um, a journalist <laughs> saying to me, but you don't have any children. What did they mean by children? You have ex-children? Mm, I mean, right. you know, mm. when does a child cease to be your child? I mean, 6, 16, 26, you know, mm. the whole idea of, of extended family responsibilities. And I thought to myself, well, what am I to say? Pe children, people aren't parcels. And I remember Helen Clark saying, well, basically put it on the shelf, you know, <laughs> and, and live... The, you, people, you don't put responsibilities like that. And I think that's something which is very badly represented in public life, those values of human, necessary human connection. And we're all competitive individuals, and we're all set basically to be suspicious of each other in the competitive race. And you have to present yourself as an as a autonomous, effective, mm. well-managed person, you know. And um, uh, I think the, our society is suffering from exactly that. Mm -hmm. The invisibility of care and connection and the work and the commitment, and that's why I'm so critical of these autobiographies, this commitment sort of <laughs> like this, you know, somebody's doing it. 
And so the whole, the whole value structure of politics is actually anti-life, if we're honest. And more power to the Prime Minister. I think she's great modelling a different... And acknowledging the limitations and requirements of that role. Mm. We're just going to do a quick roundup on, on the living well bit, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, and Sean, I just, I mean, it might be self-evident why a cannabis expert is on a panel about living well. <laughs> In Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what are, what are the, some of the things that, through your research that you, we've had an interesting talk about mental health and what, whether people need pills or what they actually need and how that kind of triangulates. What are you yeah, look, I'm not anti-pills. Well. I'm not, you know, some people are. No, no, no. I mean, you know, some of the uh, things we've done in medicine are amazing. We've got some wonderful treatments. You look at cancer treatment, it's getting better every single year, slowly and surely. But that said, when, pe when, 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 when older people came into hospital, and I used to do it, they used to be on 10 or 12 different tablets, and the first thing we do is stop all the tablets. And they'd suddenly get way better. Because <laughs> there's so many tablets and so many interactions going on there. Uh, cannabis specifically, I think, um, you know, obviously it's topical. We're going to see how the medical rules and the social rules fall out. Uh, a lot of people, of course, don't care about those rules and they do what they want to do anyway. <coughs> uh, uh, yeah. And, you know, I think it's got great potential. I mean, what I like about it is, you know, try and see if, if, it, if it, you know, learn about the risks, if it helps you with things, great, and if not, then, then don't mm. use it. And you're not a massive fan of doctors prescribing, are you? You're, you're it's not going to work. Place with no. Yeah. And, no. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a hard-headed scientist, but for the first time, like you, I interviewed people for, for my cannabis book, and I just learned so much. And what, what, what I learned is um, they're absolute experts, these people with medical conditions and cannabis. They've got folders full of all the latest research, and, 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 and they're trying all the different combinations of THC and, and CBD and different ways of taking it and uh, they know a hundred times more than any doctor is going to know and it's trial and error and they'll try something oh that worked and I'll keep on doing that and that doesn't fit with a doctor prescribing three pills in a, you know, to take in a morning um, fortunately here compared to say the USA we have quite a functional health system I know it's not perfect uh, but in the USA one of the big things with medical cannabis is for senior people they just can't afford the prescription medicines That's and right. the cannabis costs a fraction yeah. of it That's and can right. help with so many of them yeah. and don't even start me on the opiate problem which we could spend all day debating but which cannabis is a potential solution absolutely to? Mm. so you know I think it, we'll see how it all plays out but you can put you know and I wrote this book independently with, with no fixed opinion but I'm, I'm a huge supporter mm. Mm. yeah yes I hope you're all going to vote for to legalise it <laughs> I say And um, Renee, when I was looking for you, through your book, I thought that I would look for some tips for longevity, and, and most of your um, centenarians, <laughs> 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 they all seemed to um, be bemused that they'd lived so long. They did. Um, oh, well, some people were funny, they were quite competitive. You know, mm. they said, oh, well, Auntie Mary got to 103, so I'm going to get to 104. <laughs> that was kind of their life ambition. Mm. Um, other people, yeah, they said, I have no idea why I've got to mm. this age because my parents died young and, mm. and I've had a terrible diet and I've lived through cancer and I've been diabetic and I've smoked and everything else. So, um, mm. yeah, it was a little bit of a mystery. So, yeah. 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 I remember one, guy, one patient I'll never remember, uh, forget, <laughs> 20, 20 years ago, uh, and he, he looked pretty old to me. And and, I was just, and he just said, oh, can you tell my young lad I'm in hospital? I said, yeah, I'll tell your young lad. I said, how old are you? I said, how old are your young lad? And he said, 81. <laughs> cool. I didn't read your book for longevity tips, tips. I read that for activism tips. <laughs> But can I, can I also mm. say that um, a lot of it came, obviously physically if they were well, it was amazing, but mm. I would go into some interviews and they're sitting there in the middle of a novel or they're watching something, mm. you know, political or something that's really engaging and I thought, oh, this is going to be a good interview. But every person I interviewed, I said, how do you spend your time? How do you spend your day? And one, one man just blew me away. He said, oh, well, I have a quarter acre section I look after, and I've just come back from the Chatham mm. Islands on a fishing trip, and I go for a two-mile walk every morning and don't stop, and I play golf three times a week, and, you know, cooking and cleaning takes up quite a bit of time, and um, I do a bit of painting, and um, I'm just about to drive down and see my son, you know, all the way down, you know, four-hour trip, you know, next weekend, and I just thought, wow, you know, mm. and then he took me for a ticket tour in his car, and I was like, whoa, so... Um, 
yeah, yeah. it was it was really inspiring and um they and often had to fit you in as well didn't they yeah 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 some of their some of their schedules were so me. full yeah. 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 yeah if someone rings me up and they do wanting to come and have an interview or something i have to look in the diary and just say well you know a couple of weeks thursday is that all right sort of thing yeah and it seems surprising yeah i think them. you're just waiting around i think mm. they just think i'm lying oh. about you know yeah. uh, books happen by magic yeah like, you know it's like just all so way. lovely yeah. for renee yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah so brand new no research. i get someone else to do that fill it up fill it up so some brand new research actually is optimism yeah. So a study looking at people's, you know, optimist oh, or yeah. pessimist. Yeah. And the, the, the odds of reaching the age of 85 for optimistic people was over 60% higher. Mm. Yeah, very, yeah. Very I, I would Mind describe myself body. as a cynical optimist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but that's interesting because that's about sort of contentment and positivity rather than happiness because there's that pursuit of happiness yeah. which is kind of graspy and you yeah, know. yeah 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 but yeah. it translates into longevity so i don't know what the mechanism of action is yeah. there but it's very interesting mm. i also had the concept that people would say oh everyone you met must have been must have had a really happy life and must be really optimistic and um the lots of people told me about you know their child dying young mm. um there were, you know, some really tragic situations yeah. and a lot of them didn't have very easy lives. Mm. I mean, they lived through the depression, you know. So it's really genetic, years. isn't it? Ge yeah. It's sort of, uh, yeah, I, what I really believe is that it's genetic inheritance and it's the luck of the draw. My sister died when she was 60. Uh, you know, I miss her to this day. There's nothing like a sister. And my brother died a couple of years ago. He was 86. And... Um, and I just struck the jackpot, it seems, and I don't know how long it'll last, but I mean, it just seems um, so arbitrary, so kind of, um, yeah, I don't know that there's anything, I mean, I, I guess you can make changes so that the life you have is, is more um, comfortable or or you're better off or whatever. But I, I think, like, if you're going to live longer, you're going to get things wrong. Your body's going to disintegrate and you're not going to get a hell of a lot of sympathy if you go to the doctor, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, and so there are things you have to do. And so, you know, you just got to... I, I mean, I just think, oh... Um, no, I won't say... I, <laughs> I, just, I just say, I think, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think, yeah, yeah. And, um, but yeah, they look at me like I'm, I've never done anything. Like, even if it, I hadn't been a writer, for example, I would have been in theatre. Like, it, I, it's, it seems to me there's a, something when you go that... Uh, that's why I think they need more, tra well, poor things, more training in dealing with um, older people. There's a kind of mindset we have, in, at least in New Zealand, um, where the, any kind of capacity for feeling sorry or any sympathy or anything like that shuts off after you turn to about 60 when you go to a doctor. After that, everything is seen as part of growing old, and it's not. It's because they're just teenagers. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, I know. yeah. You know, why, why, is, why is the doctor 17? I, I mean, yeah. I, I well, some of them are really funny. I said to this young guy, when I, I had, you all know I had cancer and I had a double mastectomy, and this guy had, was on the medical team and had been detailed off, I was one of his details that he had to look after. So I said to him, like the first thing you say to anybody if you've got Maori connection is where you're from. So I said to him, where you're from? And he said, oh, I don't ever tell anyone it's Tokoroa. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I said, well, I think it's great. How many doctors are, you know, coming out of... And I said, and the Prime Minister's, uh, she lived there, didn't she, or something? So he cheered up a bit after that, <laughs> thinking, well, he's sort of in good company. Mm. But it's... Um, you don't very often get them on a, a... You don't get treated as an equal, is what I'm struggling to say, I guess. It, you you get treated as there's a power thing between them and me. And when I refuse to accept that, um, like, because why would it? Why should I? Um, then they get a little surprised and they pull themselves together and, um, and start talking like a human being. Um, and then we get on fine. Hmm. Yeah. 
they're trying to teach us to do that better. <laughs> <laughs> Be <Yeah>. human. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. And, yeah, I think so. It, just see people as people. And, like, everyone, like, whatever age, you have heartache and sorrow. It doesn't matter. It comes with the territory, doesn't it? And my heartache and sorrow at the moment is my eyesight. Like, this is the biggest tragedy that has ever happened to me. I've got macular degeneration, and I can't see. I can't see Emma's face, clearly, or anything like that. And you know what they call it? They call it um, uh, vision impaired. I mean, those two words do not cover the whole thing of getting up, finding your glasses, you know, your hearing aids or whatever, peeling potatoes, I mean, is now a risky business. I haven't cut a finger yet, but I mean, I guess it will probably come a time. Um, and, and like vision impaired, is that the kind of language that we want? What does it mean? And no one, no one has asked me how I'm managing. Like, it. It, it really, yeah, there's something to be written about that. <laughs> yeah. And if someone tells you they're, like, hearing impaired or vision impaired, just take on board that is really serious. It's not just a um, something like um, unconscious bias, which is something else that drives me bananas. Because uh, there's nothing unconscious about it, That's really. That's right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's full on. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Oh, we'll get into that later. Yeah. So if there's yeah. any questions, feel free to um, put your hands up. And we are recording this for a podcast, which I neglected to oh, mention far, at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When I did my party trick of dropping the microphone, so I'll try not to do that again. So when um, I come to you, please speak right into the microphone and hold it like you're about to lick an ice cream. Thanks. Okay, questions? Yeah. Um, uh, quite regularly, I get slick publications, advertisements uh, in my uh, mailbox uh, about the wonderful retirement homes and they're being built to the great and also the developments, the one-story massive developments in Stoke, which used to be orchards. And as far as I can see, they are old folk uh, ghettos. And I find living in a mixed neighborhood means, as I'm 87, um, if somebody needs help or I need help, there's all age groups around. So I am very opposed to um, such um, limited age groups all grouped together. And I think uh, several of you have mentioned the importance of intergenerational um, importance. Mm. That's something that we talked about in the green room about this current mm. housing businesses. Well, your children aren't going to thank you if you die two weeks after moving into one of these grand white hutches um, because uh, the largest company providing such accommodation uh, is growing at 10% um, a year at share value because um, they keep the money. Yes. Um, so uh, despite the advertisements, it's well to look very, very carefully and I, I actually think that moving in old age is actually very problematic, depending on your community. And various people have said to me, oh, they need to downsize. Well, um, do they? Um, actually, moving house costs you about $40,000 by the time you've paid the lawyers and the movers and you've taken all that stuff away and wonder where it is and you can't find it next time. <laughs> and, that's going to buy you an awful lot of taxi fares if you need a driver um, to stay put if, you're, if you already have established links. So my feeling is think very carefully uh, about... Um, uh, I, I was adamantly opposed to downsizing and um, uh, John and I have left little middens around the world of little... Uh, uh, we're the last repository of the printed word so we got together with some friends who didn't know what to do with their libraries. We looked at each other and we thought, well, 
fairly obvious, really, get a buy a library, live in it, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's essentially what we've done, although they have been better about downsizing. I feel like we've left crumbs around the world, uh, John and I, so in case we can't find our way out, you know, it's a path of stuff. But then I look around, and most people have downsized to acres of containers, which are full of all the things they shouldn't have bought in the first place. So there's a stuff issue. And so we, um, we're, we're engaged in another sort of experiment, which is an alternative to, I hope, who knows? I mean, let's keep moving. So we got together with somebody, another couple with a huge library. And we've bought a large, ex, um, beautiful house. It's much nicer than we'd have if we just had ourselves. And it's fun. Uh, of course, there's lots of personal issues about how you're going to live in an extended household. And there's a huge amount of assumptions there. And who knows? Um, you have to look at yourself as a housemaid. If you're selecting housemates, I personally recommend um, people who are the graduates of Catholic boarding schools, they're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I never had anything good to say about Catholic boarding schools until I met my housemates and realised that they were well-mannered and respectful <laughs> and tidy and clean <laughs> and willing <Repressed>. marginally <laughs> to um, tolerate my... And I had to look at myself too, because that's another thing. If you're going to have a collective household, um, what do you bring to it? And I was rather astonished to find not only had I never lived alone, ever, uh, in all sorts of different ways, which is worth thinking about. I mean, you enjoy being you on your like own. It, yeah. I, I've, it sounds like your worst nightmare. I've never... Oh, yeah. yeah. Hell so, yeah. you know, Hell. all those things come in, 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 <laughs> into it. Hell yes. <laughs> I also realised that because I... <laughs> I'd grown up thinking I was equal to a man because I'd had this all women's education. That uh, until I was 28 and got married, I'd never ever made my own bed. And I simply assumed that there were people who did that sort of thing. <laughs> and then I married a Kiwi and I discovered that marriage wasn't the solution to the servant problem <laughs> for me. It was his solution to the servant problem, but mine not, and I've been protesting that ever since. So I had to have a pretty good look at my slovenly approach. And it, it was a weird thing, you know, but at Oxford, my scout opened the curtains and tried, that was the first thing she did in the morning, to introduce me to the day unsuccessfully. And there were always people who well, picked up your underwear and it appeared back in the drawer, folded, and I, 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 I was trained to be an intellect, international intellectual, and it was very odd that nobody does it anymore. <laughs> and it, strangely, it can get on the, the absence of gnomes and pixies who do these things gets on the nerve of your housemates. <laughs> and they've grown up without gnomes and pixies. And um, so there's a lot of adjustment mm, you have to make mm. and you have to think it through. But there's huge advantages, economic advantages, um, companionship, uh, wonderful conversations. The only concession we've really had to make, I think, that's really been, you know, deliberate, is we have to have two copies of the London Review of Books so that nobody <laughs> snatches them or hides them in the toilet or whatever. Or we have to rely on Vodafone to provide us with re readable printed words. We are the last repository of the printed book. Um, and, but I, to me, conversation and so forth. But I mean, I think you have to have some level of compatibility, how much you have to have is entirely up to, up to you, really. Uh, I don't know if you knew that uh, Nelson has the highest proportion of PhDs in the country in its population. So um, we have th three. I'm the odd one out. I never bothered to finish any of mine. And um, we've got three manuscripts on the go. So there's enough, whether there's enough long term, whether it provides 
sufficient nurturance, but it's a start of thinking. And, and then, as I say, we have the third generation and we're co-parenting four-year-old who brings lots, who drops lots of things and just like me, thinks the gnome's in the pit. She thinks I'm the gnome in the pit, put them back in the bag. So there's lots of learning. But there's a potential there for thinking through other ways of, of um, managing loneliness, isolation, um, you know, inequality and, and cost and, you know, all of, all of those things. I'm just eyeing up Sean yeah. here as the odd, the odd man out and wondering who does your washing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, we've got a different issue. We're, we're recent empty nesters, so that's a different issue oh, for us. Oh, interesting, yeah. yeah. Sorry we've got a saying. couple of questions up no, the back No, it sounds here. hideous. That's what oh, we've got questions. Say. More questions? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, kia ora, thank you. Um, Renee, you were mentioning about um, uh, the uh, visually impaired. I noticed um, with the Blind Foundation when they had a recent collection, they're now called um, the Blind yeah, and vision Low Vision. vision. That's like, right. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, to acknowledge that, you know, yeah. people, yeah, in your situation as well. Um, something that hasn't been brought up this morning, but um, I have a brother and a sister-in-law who find themselves as parents now, um, and that's something that some people, uh, it's, it's sort of a more recent acknowledgement, I think, with work and income, um, you have uh, grandparents as parents, and they've been, my brother-in-law 70 now, but they've been looking after a young boy since he was um, three, so that's a whole other area now yeah. that some grandparents are finding themselves in, um, It's it, and it's, it's pretty taxing watching them, um, and similarly, like you brought up the comment, I looked after my partner, he was 14 years older than me, for the last four years of his life till he died, um, I only had help from Presbyterian support for one hour in the morning to shower and dress him. It was not nearly enough. So for those of us who decide to look after, you know, our, our um, loved ones, you know, um, the, the support is, is very minimal and it's, it's absolutely taxing on you. Um, yeah, so just, yeah, I wanted to acknowledge the people who do choose to, to care in their own homes and yeah. that too. Yeah, mm. but those two areas, you know, are yes. really important too because it's a hell of a shock. You know, suddenly you, you become a carer for your partner. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There was another question over in the middle. Yep. And we try this. Thank you to the panel. That's been really interesting. Um, after interviewing your centurions, have you changed anything in your own lifestyle? Um, you've, you've, yeah, leave it at that. Have, mm. has, it, if, has it had an effect on anything, you, the way you think and what you do? Hmm, it's a good question. Um, I think to start with, it makes you feel very young <laughs> <laughs> to be around centenarians. Um, that often sort of say to me, oh, you're just, just a young thing. And um, yeah, um, I think for me, it's, oh, it's a good question as far as my own lifestyle. Um, I just think I'm, as long as, because some people have sort of said to me, how would you feel if you're 100 and would you want to be 100? Um, I think as long as I was physically well and my mind was, was lucid, then, then I'd be quite happy to, to be 100. But I think it's just broadened my thinking about um, older people. And the reason I did the book was to... I realised that there were a lot of people that were becoming a little bit isolated in our communities, that weren't, their voices weren't sort of told. And I thought, what if I sat next to a person? What would they say? What stories would they tell me about their lives? What could I learn? So um, I think from what I've learned is that it's incredible, the attitudes of people that I've talked to, that they're still out and about and the, you know, the living life, like I said before, you know, there's people that are that are over 100 years old that, you know, they've just got so much go, that, you know, their attitude to life. It, it's when I'm talking to them, uh, I can almost, it's hard to imagine that they're actually that age. Um, I often would say to people, how old do you actually feel? And I said that to a, a person that I first saw driving a Lamborghini on TV when he was 100. And um, I said to him, how old do you feel? And he said, when I'm behind the wheel, I feel about 40. <laughs> um, and, and other times I feel around about 70. So I think it's just, yeah, it's kind of made me feel quite optimistic about getting older, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, as a mere 75-year-old, um, 
I'm, I'm wondering about the uh, role of actually speaking to older people um, rather than their younger agents. And I know when I turned 75, something actually happened. My attitude changed for some reason. And I see things differently now. And a lot of people are making decisions on older people's behalf and they're 20 years younger. And I think a lot more attention needs to be paid to um, listening to the older people rather than their agents. And I'd like you to comment upon that. Thank you. Yeah, I'm. I'm <laughs> yes, of course. I think. I think that. Um, I, I don't really. I really don't see myself as an expert on aging or living or anything like that. I think the two pieces of luck I've had. Um, my mother taught me to read before I was five, and that has been the greatest gift. And the other great gift she gave me, which I wasn't so happy about, but which I had to do, was work. And I, I began work, I mean, when I was quite young, and then I went out to work when I was 12. So it's like, I think, while I, while I was dreadfully, dreadfully unhappy about not being able to go to high school, um, what I now realise is that some things happened to me that I now am glad about. I'm very resilient and I'm... I'm very much kind of able to look after myself and see to myself. Um, it's not that I don't like other people. I do, I do. And as long as they agree with me, they're, <laughs> they're fine. Um, and, at, like, and I like to see people and feed people and all that kind of thing. But I think that it is true that people should listen I'm, I too am heartily sick of experts on the radio telling me how to live. Yeah, none of them say anything remotely approaching the life I live, which is a happy, w fulfilling one. You know what I mean? It's not like. I would just like to tell you reading a poem by a 10-year-old yesterday who talked about how he would die. And we seem to avoid the topic of death for the younger generation. And I would like to know what you, as a panel, you haven't mentioned the idea of voluntary euthanasia, which is such an essential issue for every single one of us. Uh, yeah, I've thought about that and I am a little nervous about some of it. But in terms of my own um, preparation, I suppose you could say, um, I've had my coffin made. I've got um, a funeral uh, fund. It's not very big. And I thought I don't even want them to spend, my sons to spend that on a flash coffin. So the middle one went to a weekend course and made me a coffin. I got this te I got this text during the weekend saying, How how tall are you? <laughs> Which was uh, but when I went up on the last East Coast trip, um this particular son said, um, would you like to see it? And I said, yeah, I would. So I went and saw it. And, you know, I was very, very touched because they would put a little brass thing on it with Rene on it. <laughs> but what touched me was that these two heterosexual middle-aged guys had put rainbow handles on it. <laughs> and don't you think that is just, that is one of the loveliest th sort of things. My heart was just touched so much by that. And so those are the things. In terms of euthanasia, I just think um, there's probably a lot to be said. I certainly don't want to die in severe pain with nothing happening. I understand that. The, the only thing I think about is people who can't make those decisions themselves and who's going to do it. Who's going to do it? That's all. Yeah. It looks like we might be having a, a, ref, a, a referendum on this next year as well. So I, I predict next year no one will care about the election at all. It's all going to be cannabis and euthanasia. Yes. We're going to be debating about it, which is probably a good thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, my, my, my wife got to quite interested in this today because there's a new company in America and they can actually turn your ashes, it takes about a year, into a diamond ring. <laughs> so I think she wants to knock me off oh. so she gets some more jewelry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Mine are just going back to Wairau. I mean, hey, that's pretty dull, isn't it? But never mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's Burning bodies is a major source of dioxin. Well, not a major, it's a minor source of dioxins. Um, every time we burn carbon, we produce carcinogens. So um, that's just one thing oh, to add to the debate. Throwing into the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. conversation As yeah. we tick down uh, for 30 I more think seconds. The, <laughs> the, um, the thing which strikes me most is that Pākehā are not at all good at grief and mourning. And um, I, well, I, I hope so because, for example, I just had a suicide of a 20-year-old in the family and the, the church was full of young people with grief, nowhere to put, nowhere to process that. And I contrast that to the wonderful model we have with Māori and I think why aren't we managing the realities of death and grief in this much more... Um, actually, we have an opportunity to do it in a really positively... Um, a positive Kiwi way and I think... So I think that hiding away um, and, and not being able to find the words uh, and on the euthanasia question, it's one of the ones that divides our household very strongly. Some people fear, um, fear uh, um, the tensions between generations will mean that there's a, a motive to um, get rid of people and get the house, and others that, of course, it's a choice to... Uh, but I do think that we've all got... We now have the four... Um, advanced care brochures, they're actually quite difficult to work through on your own. You need some medical help about the issues, but they are at least a step in the right direction of, of, of having the medical system try and tie up with us and go through uh, the things we need to think about. So I recommend them and they're available from the hospital. Well, that's an interesting place to leave it. <laughs> a round of applause for our panellists. Thank you all. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> So good. <laughs> and I'd like to, to second that, but also to say that uh, Rene, uh, Rene and Sean at least, and perhaps Philida will come down here anyway so people can come up and have a chat. Are you happy to do that, Philida? Yeah. Um, and so the others are here to sign, sign copies of their books, which are available at the Page and Blackmore bookstore. Um, so do encourage you to come up and continue the conversation a little. And I also wanted to say that Rene is back tomorrow afternoon at 3.30 on a, um, for a session called Backing Wildcards because one thing she's done at 90 is publish her first ever crime novel, which is called The Wild Thing. And, I, and she's with Becky Manawatu, who is a young... Um, Westport-based uh, writer who, but who studied here in Nelson, and her book Away is out. I probably mangled that pronunciation. Sorry, <laughs> I have to get some lessons from Mary. Um, but I have a ticket for that session, and it goes to the first person who can put up their hand and tell me what year Renee was born in. With her permission, she's she's allowed me to do this. So, does anybody know who would like a ticket to tomorrow, three thirty? Yes, out the back. Correct. You're the winner. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, yeah, please, please um, come and have, browse the books, have a look at the no, bookstore no. and 29. come up and meet our panellists. And one more big round of applause to say thank you to Emma and the panellists. You're listening to the 2019 Nelson Arts Festival Page and Blackmore Puka Puka Talks.